Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the University of Rochester academic session. We're here talking with our friends from the mechanical engineering department. My name is Caroline Hansberger. I'm an admission counselor for the University of Rochester. First of all, we want to say congratulations to students who are admitted to the University of Rochester. We're really excited for you and really happy that you are looking more into Rochester and the opportunities that we have here. We hope that this session today will help you to better understand our engineering department here at Rochester, as well as learn more about student experience. I do have wonderful colleagues with me here from the mechanical engineering department. I would love for them to introduce themselves and then we'll get started with our presentation today. So I'll start with Professor Lombropoulos. Welcome. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, greetings, everybody, and welcome uh, to uh, uh, to uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, again, my name is uh, John Lombropoulos. I'm a faculty in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. I have an appointment in material science and also in the laboratory for later energetics. I've taught at the university for more than 30 years, but perhaps uh, more importantly, uh, two of my three sons have gone through U of R as undergraduates. So I've seen the university both as a parent and a teacher. Thank you. Kaylin, would you like to say hello? Yeah, I'll jump in next. Um, my name is Kaylin. I'm the undergrad coordinator for mechanical engineering. Um, I tell all my students that if I see you at least once a semester, um, our, our meetings will average at least 10 minutes, and I can pretty much guarantee you'll graduate on time, fit in the most of the goals that you are looking for minors uh, if you're trying to double major, if you're trying to do an internship, externship, study abroad opportunity. I try to be your one-stop shop for um, getting your requirements approved, getting your paperwork signed. Um, so I look forward to hopefully seeing you. I'll pass it to Katie next. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Bernaz. I'm a third year mechanical engineering student here at the university. Um, you'll probably see me if you're going into mechanical engineering. I am the TA for the intro engineering course Bridges. Um, I'm not sure if Aaron and Jacob went through that, but great course, something to look forward to. Uh, I'm looking forward to this webinar. Yes, Bridges was an amazing class that I'm excited for you guys to take next semester. But hi, I'm Jacob. Uh, and this is Aaron. Hi. We are seniors here at the U of R. Um, and we'll be glad to answer any questions or concerns you guys have. So always flag us down if you have any random question. Thank you, everyone. All right, Professor Lombropoulos, take it away. Great. So so what I will do, uh, can I share my screen? Yeah, I will share my screen here, uh, uh, Caroline. Thank you. Um, okay, fantastic. So what I will do, I will do a, a quick uh, uh, overview of both uh, uh, what uh, is mechanical engineering and specifically what mechanical engineering at U of R is like. So basically, uh, 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 those uh, those slides, uh, uh, the admissions office uh, already has. So if anybody wants to get their hands on the slides, please contact uh, our friends in the admissions office. So basically, what is mechanical engineering? Mechanical engineering is dealing with uh, four basic topics. We can call this maybe five topics. Uh, building structures, using materials, using fluids in order to convey and transport energy and power. That's the high level summary. Okay. Now, uh, the, so the essence of uh, mechanical engineering, as I was just mentioning, on mechanics and materials, essentially answering the question. And I would like to pose those questions, the kind of question I would pose to a 12 year old, because if a 12 year old can understand the question, certainly an 18 year old will understand uh, the question and the answer. Basically, why do structures fail? Why, if you uh, bend the paper clip back and forth, it will, it will eventually break? Uh, whereas uh, why would uh, an aircraft uh, uh, actually eventually uh, fail? Uh, in, in fluids, energy, and power, how we produce propulsion? What kind of fuels can we use? Can we use alternative fuels? Certainly applications in the area of uh, aerospace. But perhaps the most important uh, difference between, and this is a standard question we get all the time, what's the difference between physics and engineering? Is that in engineering, a large portion of what we learn is in order to do engineering design. And engineering design is a very simple question. Again, the kind of question uh, I would pose to a 12-year-old. How do you make a gadget 
or a structure or a superstructure or a system so as to accomplish a specific goal, a specific objective that helps people live safer lives, longer lives, cheaper lives, uh, happier lives. In other words, how do we make something in order to accomplish a specific goal? That's the nature of engineering design. Physicists do not do design. Engineers, including mechanical engineers, do a lot of design. Now, the tools that uh, our students use, extensive. I will give you many examples in just a minute. Uh, virtual design and simulation using very state-of-the-art uh, modern computation tools. A lot of hands-on and experimentation uh, project uh, work. Uh, I'll, I'll turn the floor to uh, Katie uh, and, and Aaron and Jacob uh, to give us uh, some examples. Uh, and perhaps uh, most importantly, engineering teamwork with the emphasis on the word team and communication. Uh, I cannot overemphasize how important it is to be able to communicate successfully, either, even whether it's over one minute, what do we call an elevator uh, 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 pitch, or a 45-minute talk. Communicating successfully uh, is, is a very important part of any area of engineering, certainly mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, uh, I just uh, summarized sort of the, the top half of this slide, mechanics and materials, fluid energy power, and so on and so forth. Now, what's the, what's the bottom line in all this analysis? The bottom line is to combine what I call, and, and Katie will recognize, because this is something I've been mentioning in the courses currently taking with me, to co combine push button or if you like dial inputs, something you can turn up a, you know, a dial or push a button in order to increase, decrease some intensity. And then we have uh, materials that have uh, different material properties, a system or a, or a component has a size, geometry, and shape. And then we measure and assess uh, what uh, comes out of uh, this system. And then we'll go back and repeat. Essentially, that's the essence of, uh, of engineering and, and, and design. Uh, I would like to uh, show from here uh, uh, something that was published about 20 years ago. And, and, and so the National Academy of Engineering, perhaps the most uh, august uh, body of uh, engineers of all types, uh, 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 certainly the United States, likely the world, uh, they have listed the 20th century greatest engineering achievements. So the 20th century is my century. I grew up and went to school. I had a lot of my career during the, the 20th century. In a minute, I will be showing you about the 21st century, which is your century. And I've listed, I've listed here in, in, in red uh, basic uh, 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 achievements with, that had a significant mechanical engineering component in them. I will mention spacecraft, uh, highways, air conditioning, refrigeration, agricultural machines, water supply, aircraft, cars, electrifying uh, the world, uh, household appliances, uh, uh, nuclear technologies, high performance. The point I'm making is that uh, in two thirds of what was accomplished in this uh, last uh, century, in the 20th century, mechanical engineering played a very big role. But I want to make a very important point in the context of this uh, slide in just a minute. Uh, just to give you a, a little bit of an idea of what uh, mechanical engineering at the U of R, the University of Rochester, is like. Uh, uh, again, uh, mechanical engineers are very versatile, flexible, uh, uh, broadly based uh, and educated engineers in the profession. Uh, uh, they apply their skills in all types of uh, jobs, in, including design, development, manufacturing, research, and resource management. Uh, I think that I, I think that uh, Kaylin has some data uh, from the Green Center, which is the uh, career and placement uh, uh, center at, at the university. So we'll talk a little bit more about detail on this. Uh, on the bottom uh, left is uh, is the class that just graduated this past May. Uh, to give you a sense of uh, to give you a sense of uh, what our class uh, looks like, uh, we have uh, uh, and w w and we always want to improve on diversity uh, in our student body, just like the U of R actually does. And on the right hand side, I have a uh, what I call the standard four year program. Although in my experience, very few pro very few students go through the standard four year program, but this is an idea to give you this is to give an idea of essentially what kind of course you're taking. So you start by taking math, chemistry. Uh, 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 English composition uh, and a technical elective. Uh, this is a course that uh, that uh, Katie is currently uh, a TA for. Uh, and in the spring, you continue with math, physics, uh, uh, the first engineering course, which is ME 120 statics, uh, and in distribution requirement or humanities and social sciences. So that's basically the, the basic structure of the program. Uh, 
Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, mechanical engineering design because uh, one can talk about optimizing some performance, but we have to be careful because what we mean by optimizing? One may want to design something that's technically as good as it can get, something that's as inexpensive as it can get, something that's environmentally safe. Environmentally safe, it means that the lifetime of the product, whatever effects it may have, the effects will be over one to 10 years, or whether the design is actually sustainable. And sustainability is defined on a time horizon between 10 to 100 years. And there are different metrics on how we optimize one or several of these, uh, uh, if you like, uh, performance indices. That's something that we, uh, we, we, we train our students uh, very, uh, very effectively throughout the four-year curriculum. Just to give you uh, an idea of some applications, uh, clearly uh, application of mechanical engineering, uh, uh, applications in uh, energy efficient homes, uh, applications in aircraft. Uh, I, I'm sure you read uh, uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, couple of months, as recently as yesterday, that uh, a larger aircraft manufacturer in the United States has had a lot of problems with failing parts and during flights. Clearly, a very concerning incident. But uh, aerospace is clearly one big application. And for the students attending, I will mention that uh, starting this fall. We're uh, uh, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. We're starting a uh, minor in aerospace engineering. Uh, another application is the area of, of uh, 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 nuclear fusion. So fusion is a clean energy uh, capability. Uh, if you saw the movie uh, uh, Oppenheimer, as, as I hope you did, directed by uh, Chris uh, Nolan, you will remember that the second uh, bomb uh, dropped uh, during uh, uh, during. Uh, during, uh, you know, after the Los Alamos uh, work, actually uh, hinged, used uh, this fusion concept to create a lot of energy. Uh, however, in our uh, mechanical engineering world, we use fusion you know, to produce clean, controllable energy for, for, for let's say, for productive uh, 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 human uh, purposes. On the right-hand side, I have something that's really uh, fascinating to me. Uh, I show uh, the application of fluid mechanics. Uh, the vessels that you see, our vessels in the human brain, uh, and, and we do uh, research and apply fluid mechanics in understanding how blood flow through the brain efficiently or inefficiently removes deposited proteins in the brain, because if such proteins are not removed appropriately or fast enough, they can lead to uh, debilitating uh, diseases such as uh, Alzheimer's disease. Clearly, this this, this this medical approach to understanding uh, diseases of this magnitude and this and, and, and this and this kind of outcomes is clearly of great benefit uh, uh, to humanity for everybody uh, nationally and of course internationally I, I just want to give you something now that uh, since I presume all of us have uh, refrigerators in our homes I want to show you how uh, mechanical engineers have improved significantly in building better refrigerators and a refrigerator is an engineering structure that is as good as any other. Uh, you will see there from uh, from uh, the top in the blue uh, in the blue graph. So this goes from 1972 to about uh, six or seven years ago. In the blue graph shows that uh, the size of the refrigerator uh, uh, increases. Uh, in red uh, is the cost in energy. You will see that the cost in energy in the graph in the in the in the red graph has decreased by a factor of four. Well, at the same time, in green you will see the price of the refrigerator. So refrigerators are getting cheaper by a factor of four. They're getting more efficient by a factor of four. We're getting bigger. Well, this doesn't happen by magic. This happens because uh, they're designed better, better insulating materials. And this is a large uh, part of uh, what mechan some mechanical engineers work who work in heating, ventilation, uh, and, and, and air conditioning. Uh, one, one important point that uh, that uh, I was emphasizing, and I want to add to this important idea, is that uh, we can talk about mechanical engineering design, you know, from the technical side, the cost side, the environmental side, or the sustainability side. But perhaps an overriding theme that trumps everything else is the ethical responsibility of the engineer. Uh, uh, engineers are professionals, uh, just like lawyers are just like doctors are, just like nurses are. All these professions need to uh, abide by a specific code of professional ethics, contrary to other professions such as, for example, plumbers. 
politicians, economists, who do not have to live up to these uh, ethical, professional ethical responsibility. And just to give you an idea, uh, this is a question that very often students will actually get wrong. Is this statement true or false? Engineers in the fulfillment of their professional duties must carefully consider the safety, health, and welfare of the public. And the response is that uh, this is a false statement because it's a false statement because uh, the correct statement says engineers will hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. To put this in perspective, I can carefully consider the safety of a Boeing 787 very carefully, as opposed to I will hold most important the safety, health, and welfare of the people flying in the Boeing 787. And I think you see here the point being made. Uh, I would like to uh, emphasize that uh, in this uh, uh, professional uh, code of uh, engineering uh, uh, ethics, I would like to uh, read this last uh, statement that uh, engineers shall conduct themselves honorably, responsibly, ethically, and lawfully so as to enhance the honor, reputation, and usefulness of the profession. I think this, this is a very powerful statement. It's powerful because think, for example, the people who govern our lives, for example, politicians, do politicians always act honorably, responsibly, ethically, and lawfully? I'm sure some of them do. I'm sure some of them don't, as I'm sure you realize by simply uh, reading uh, the nightly uh, the night the nightly news. Uh, some uh, some examples of uh, projects that our students actually uh, work on. Uh, we have from here on the left hand side. So these are components of. So this is a second year course on engineering thermodynamics. On the left, we have a, a coal fired, uh, essentially fossil fuel steam plant uh, operating with water. Our students learn how to 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 analyze this operation very very well. On the right hand side. A parallel technology that instead of using water uses uh, compressed uh, uh, gas, typically air. And the point that I want to make is that uh, if you use water, you can have an efficiency of about 30%. But if you use air, you have an efficiency of 60%. This is terrific. You double the efficiency if you use air. However, when you use air, the temperature reaches 1200 degrees Celsius. That's a very, that's a very high temperature. Most metals will actually melt at that temperature. When you use uh, water, the maximum temperature is 650 degrees Celsius. Therefore, clearly you see that you can do much better, but you need more robust, more uh, heat resistant, stronger materials to take advantage of this engineering uh, capability. Uh, here's another example of, uh, of uh, uh, work that our students do using, uh, using a virtual simulation. Uh, this is a one component, one automotive component, a valve train lifter. You see on the left uh, uh, a CAD model. I'm sure that many students in high school, probably you've done some kind of CAD work, not surprising, but you'll see that uh, in the second, third, and fourth uh, uh, panels, you will see that uh, this uh, CAD uh, system is discretized using very sophisticated numerical methods, and eventually significant stresses are computed, which eventually will lead to the failure, or if small enough, to, to the component actually being saved. Uh, Again, uh, using software on how to optimize for stiffness and lightness of an engineering component, you will see that there on the left, you have a block of material, uh, and, and, and you can optimize, you can make this structure as light as possible and as, and, and as strong as possible by removing material judiciously. You cannot simply remove material from everywhere. You remove material from where material is not needed. Therefore, you, you gain in weight, well, uh, and also gain in stiffness and, and actual strength. Uh, this is another example of this uh, valve train assembly. Uh, the simulation shown on the left, you will see that uh, on the panel on the right, top right, uh, there's a circular hole, and you may be able to see two hairline cracks that emanate from the edges of the hole. I shouldn't have to tell you, but cracks are typically not good in an engineering structure. Uh, and you will see that uh, from the simulation on the bottom right, you will see that in red, the highest stresses are actually uh, identified and marked, and these match exactly where the crack actually originated. Therefore, you can see how by using virtual tools, you can simulate a real structure very effectively and very inexpensively. Uh, another uh, aspect of mechanical engineering, the use of engin engineering materials. Uh, clearly, I have from here a very common a uh, uh, question. Uh, we can use containers to contain wine, to contain milk, to contain soda, 
to contain soda or beer. We can use glass, uh, polyethylene, uh, polyethylene terephthalate, or aluminum. So the question is, why do we use different materials for different applications? If all these structures will hold the same kind of amount, can one contemplate other materials for building containers? Can one use steel? Yes or no. Can one use titanium? Yes or no. If not, why not? So you see from here that, uh, that uh, the choice of different materials have different implications, both for aesthetic purposes, but also for technical purposes. Uh, something that we teach uh, to our students is that all materials fall in essentially four basic categories, metals and their alloys, uh, ceramics, polymers, and, 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 and fiber reinforced composites. And all these have different properties and, and mercifully different costs. So if you want to build something that's inexpensive, you select one type of material. If it's something, a unique design, for example, the kind of designs that NASA may actually may actually uh, 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 put in space, then clearly the design considerations are very are, are very different. Uh, of course, in all these applications, the 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 cycle of uh, the engineering uh, uh, of the engineering uh, material is very important. I show here uh, the life cycle that we start from essentially getting something out of the earth, then we produce a material, then we produce the product, we use the product, we discard the product. The discarded product goes back into uh, refinishing a material. So this 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 essentially the recycle uh, the recycle uh, cycle, and 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 in different parts of this recycle uh, uh, structure, if you like, uh, different engineering principles come into play. Clearly, you need to have to apply mechanical forces. Clearly, you need to apply heat in order to uh, 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 go from the discarded product to uh, reutilize uh, this uh, material. Uh, again, something very important that we uh, educate our, stu our students in is uh, the idea that uh, there are very efficient geom very efficient shapes, but any shape can be made even more efficient by coupling the shape with a specific microstructure. So you will see there that, uh, that uh, under conditions of tension, bending, torsion, and compression, which are the four standard uh, uh, modes of uh, loading uh, uh, an engineering component, we could have a material, we could have what's called a macro shape, and then the shape itself can have a microstructure. So going from a material to a shape with a microstructure, that's a very powerful idea, and we teach these principles in the second and third year of the mechanical engineering program. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, this idea of uh, uh, designing under different scenarios. One can have a light and stiff structure. So NASA wants to have something that's light and stiff. On the bottom, I want something that's economic and stiff. So for a consumer product, for example, uh, in designing an armchair or in designing a, a couch, for example, I want something that's economic. So I can, it will be, uh, the, the price uh, to acquire it will be low and something that's stiff. In other words, when you sit on a couch, you don't want to simply slump down to the ground. Okay. Uh, and again, other considerations, something that's stiff, environmental and stiff or sustainable and, and stiff. Therefore, we use different ideas on how to optimize design based on what the requirements actually are. I will give you here, here some examples of, uh, of uh, the kind of uh, projects that uh, students do. I will start from the second year and I will move to the fourth year. So in, in, in a course which I've taught many times in the past, this is a second year uh, 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 engineering thermodynamics course to design uh, a small water-based power plant as a backup for a small hospital. Requirements are technical, safety requirements, environmental, and of course, econ uh, financial, economic uh, kind of uh, requirements. Or another parallel example to redesign uh, 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 an air conditioning system that uh, rather than using uh, this uh, horrible fluorocarbon R134A, this a uh, horrible, horrible uh, 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 greenhouse uh, gas, instead one can use uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, and essentially, you can what you can do, you can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. There's a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then you use this as a refrigerant, which has essentially zero impact on the atmosphere. Therefore, you can see that, uh, that uh, uh, one can redesign very important uh, systems that improve human life while improving environmental and sustainability kind of uh, considerations, if you like. Uh, this is uh, this uh, I, I, this this could be uh, this could be a uh, this could be a, a first midterm uh, 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 exam 
in in a course that uh, that Aaron and and Jacob took two years ago and and Katie took last year. So this is essentially how to analyze uh, a cycle uh, uh, that is producing power. So this so this is how a power plant actually operates. So our students, this this is a kind of problem that a student will take probably in about half an hour. A student will be able to solve this problem very uh, very effectively. Or the opposite uh, cycle again, uh, how to design uh, uh, a cycle that can actually refrigerate. So essentially, this is how uh, 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 a refrigerator that we use in our homes or at the industrial level, you know, if you go shopping at Wegmans, you know, half of Wegmans, everything is refrigerated from shallow to deep refrigeration. So clearly, these play a very important role, both for household, but also for commercial uh, applications. Uh, so this is uh, a couple of projects uh, for a third year course in, in material science, uh, design, uh, uh, select an optical material, for building a large telescope mirror so that it will withstand uh, a range of temperatures, you know, from night uh, to day. Uh, it, it should not vibrate uh, excessively and so on and so forth. Choices are different uh, among the different uh, class of materials I mentioned previously. So this is a nice uh, first design problem on how to identify an optimal material. Uh, another, so this is a uh, typical project in the third year course. I'm actually teaching this, this course literally as we speak. We had a class this morning. Katie was in the class this morning. Uh, design, for example, this is not from this year's cycle, but it, it, from this year's uh, class, but uh, something very related to this. Design a, a cooling schedule for a large slab of very expensive glass uh, that uh, must be cooled as quickly as possible without, without the glass actually breaking. So this glass uh, costs typically $100,000. You know, that, that, that's, that's a lot of money. The, 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 the faster I can cool it, the more productivity they can actually have. But if I cool it too fast, it will actually break. So I need to optimize this process, but I don't want to be so slow that my productivity actually uh, diminishes uh, significantly. Uh, we talk in the heat transfer course, we talk a lot about uh, understanding climate change and, and global warming. Uh, I will tell you that one point I make repeatedly is that no, there are no people who doubt that uh, climate change and global warming is actually taking place. Uh, the main political argument is to who as to who is the culprit, uh, it, 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 who is responsible for global warming. But understanding the science of global warming is very important because we're all responsible citizens. Uh, and I will tell you that uh, based on what I read, very few politicians in the Senate or in, or in the House of Representatives actually understand even the basics of global warming. But of course, everybody's making uh, big uh, political statements for political consumption. So understanding the basic science from the heat transfer perspective is a very important part of one's uh, 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 engineering uh, education. Uh, this might be a, a typical uh, fourth year design project, simulate the reactivity accident. Uh, so Jen, we have a question in chat. Okay. Um, from an advising perspective, for a student who is trying to figure out how to choose between mechanical engineering and ECE, um, electrical engineering, how would you? What advice would you give them to help figure out which decision to make? So, so, so typically uh, at U of R, uh, the first semester of engineering, the first semester of any engineering discipline is what we call common. So during your first semester, uh, uh, as long as you take the the courses for in the engineering programs, uh, you can choose any uh, major uh, uh, starting in the second semester. Within the first year, each student will take one specific course in their own major, mechanical engineering or electrical engineering and so on and so forth. Uh, therefore, uh, and, and, and as a general uh, guideline, you don't get to declare your major at the University of Rochester until the end of your, of your fourth semester, until the end of your second year. Therefore, the best uh, advice I would give is that uh, don't commit to one or the other. Uh, take your standard uh, 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 courses that would be applicable both to mechanical and electrical engineering and decide at the end of the first semester. You will have met faculty, you will have met students, you will have met people like, you know, Kay Lynn and, you know, and older students uh, like, uh, like Katie and, and so on and so forth. So become uh, an, educa an educated, a sophisticated uh, 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 have be sophisticated about your options rather than commit early on, especially if you have this uh, ambiguity. What should I do? Does th does this answer you, uh, the question among the audience? Yeah, I think so. I think. Um, 
Uh, again, uh, I, I would go through some uh, uh, advanced uh, mechanical uh, design uh, uh, course contents. This is this is the what we call the capstone design courses. So both uh, both Aaron and Jake are going through this experience right now. Uh, a lot of our students do designs revolving optomechanics or using you know essentially build a uh, design and build a wind turbine using off the shelf components. So these are challenging projects. And you need a very spheric, a very global understanding and knowledge of engineering in order to accomplish, in order to complete uh, these projects. Uh, again, this was uh, the optomechanical design. You know what? Well, I will skip this. This was another product, which another design project in the fourth year that I supervised uh, a few years back. It involved building a uh, so-called trefoil uh, uh, optical surface. Think of it as being like a potato chips. The student did the CAD work for the trefoil. You show the left. Then they actually uh, manufactured uh, the trefoil by 3D printing it. They coated it with gold. Then they did some extensive optical metrology to uh, to decide uh, how what the surface actually uh, looked like. Uh, another project uh, on, on testing uh, thin sheets of uh, Gorilla Glass. This is the glass that we all use in smartphones and smart uh, tablets. Uh, and of course, you know that if if the edge of the glass chips. Uh, that's not good because you likely have to exchange uh, or, or buy a new phone. So how do you do the testing for the strength of these components? Uh, I've listed from here. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of interest in renewable energy among uh, among uh, uh, prospective uh, students in engineering. I've listed here in green what I would call U of R thrust. Uh, uh, so uh, solar uh, photovoltaic uh, power, fuel cells, biomass conversion, fusion, and hydrogen production. So there's an extensive education and research going on here at the university. Uh, I might talk about sequestration of uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, but this is too technical. I don't want to go from this. Uh, extensive uh, project work, uh, hands-on experimental work, uh, design work among the students, uh, building and testing uh, structures that have been first uh, simulated on the computer and then actually built and tested in order to optimize uh, the strength. Uh, uh, student groups that have a lot of hands-on engineering, uh, really during your hands uh, by doing engineering design, Mini Baja and Solar Splash, a lot of student involvement in these two projects. Students love this uh, project, a lot of hands-on uh, work. Uh, what do our graduates do? do when they graduate? About one-third going to graduate school, two-thirds work in industry, and there are some wonderful opportunities. Some students uh, 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 either immediately after school or within a couple of years, we'll go into business school for an MBA. Uh, some students may select to go into law school, uh, pursue patent law, which is a very lucrative uh, kind of uh, uh, legal, you know, law practice. Uh, some students are uh, working in entrepreneurship, you know, in small startups and so on and so forth. Uh, to give you an idea of uh, salaries in mechanical engineering with a BS uh, on the range of 65 to 80K per year, with a master's degree, uh, 90 to 120K uh, per year. And one advice I always give to students, even to incoming first year students, always think about what might be your next educational step four years down the line. Don't leave this for the for your last semester at the university. Oh, I need to decide what I'm gonna be doing this coming fall after I graduate. Have a plan that follows up on your education, your intellectual interest, your professional interest, and so on and so forth. The last point I want to make, and, and I and I will conclude with this. Uh, this was uh, the, this was uh, the list of 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 uh, uh, greatest engineering achievements in this past century, and now I put here the question: going back 100 years from 2003 to 1903, none of these technologies could actually be imagined or dreamt about. So they all be, they all they were all realized based on human ingenuity and engineering design. So. Uh, again, uh, the important point is that uh, uh, technology develops literally as we live uh, as we live our lives. Uh, the last point I want to uh, I want to make is that uh, also the National Academy of Engineering has published uh, the greatest engineering challenges for the 21st century. So the 21st century is your century. You will go. To, you were born likely in the 21st century. Uh, you will go to school in the 21st century. You will practice profession in the 21st century. You will raise families and be involved with people socially in the 21st century. And these are the greatest engineering challenges. And the point that I want to make is that all these challenges are much more difficult to, to classify according to mechanical, chemical, electrical, physics, chemistry, 
uh, civil engineering, optical engineering. Look, for example, uh, uh, look at the fourth one, secure cyberspace. We all agree that cyberspace should be secure so that we don't get hacked into, but is this exclusively a computer science problem? Uh, uh, problem? Or is this also a function of how you design chips and how you design computers and mainframes? Uh, look, for example, number 10, prevent nuclear terror. We all agree that nuclear terror will be uh, ho will have horrific uh, consequences, but to prevent nuclear terror, is this mechanical engineering? Is this chemical engineering? Is this physics? Is this civil engineering? And so on and so forth. Uh, look, for example, number three, provide access to clean water at the global scale. This challenge, is this chemical engineering, mechanical, electrical, economics? Clearly, the point that I'm trying to make from here is that uh, your education should be broad enough and multidisciplinary enough to be able to attack these very challenging, broad, very multidisciplinary problems. Because you will have to do that no matter what you do. So you may as well uh, acquire those skills uh, when you go through uh, when you go through uh, uh, you know university, and certainly when you go through uh, the University of Rochester. So so that's that's what I had in mind uh, to do, uh, Caroline and Andre. Uh, 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 if there are no other uh, questions. Uh, uh, maybe I, I can ask some questions to to Katie, uh, 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 Jacob, and and Aaron. But maybe uh, uh, Kaylin, are there any questions from parents? Or... We there was one question we haven't answered yet. Thank you so much, also for this information. Really fantastic. A student asked, "Is industrial and systems engineering an option?" Uh, it, it 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 one can pursue industrial and systems engineering. Uh, uh, but U of R does not give a degree in industrial and systems engineering. One can put an academic program of study. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, among uh, the standard engineering programs, mechanical, chemical, elect electrical, optical, biomedical, uh, uh, engineering, and, and, and computer science, uh, there's also the possibility of what we call a uh, independent, uh, independent studies in engineering, where a student can design their own independent program in engineering to address their own interests, for example, in, 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 in industrial design and systems engineering. But U of R does not give degrees in industrial uh, uh, design or systems engineering. Thank you. Um, I don't so see any other questions. Oh, go ahead, Kaylin. Oh, <laughs> I was gonna say, since John is done with his presentation, I was gonna pop mine up just so you have okay. some additional basic information. Okay. Um, there you go. Uh, All right, you... I'm switching it over. Um, so some of the data that we have um, on employers that our um, our Mechie students go to after they graduate include Lockheed Martin, L3 Harris, Boeing, U.S. Navy, SpaceX, uh, top industries or manufacturing, aerospace, defense, automotive. Um, Ninety something like ninety four percent of our Mechie students graduate in four years. Um, almost thirty percent of them complete a minor. Um, we offer six minors. Um, this is uh, information here on um, the distribution of, um, of our students. Um, the, these are the majors and minors that we have. Um, so th there's a lot of opportunity to really customize the program to what you are um, really passionate about and trying to achieve. Um, so highly recommend reaching out to us if you have any questions. This is our first year schedule, what to expect in the fall and spring um, as a first year student. Um, but I really hope that we get to see you here. Um, do continue typing out your questions in chat um, so that we answer all of the questions that you might have. Um, our The advising model on the U of R, um, I'm really impressed by. Um, you have a whole list of uh, advising people assigned to you coming in as a first year student so that um, depending on you know what your question is, you have people to go to right off the bat. There's there's no figuring out where to go to. Um, we are all here to help you succeed and make sure you walk away with hopefully all of your questions answered and not um, a cascade of, um, oh, well, I don't know, but go talk to this person and so. Mm. Um, so yeah, really excited. Um, there is one other friend. question. Yeah. yeah, sure. Someone asked, how does the geomechanics degree differ from the standard Mechi degree? Oh, oh okay. John, can you answer? Yeah. Yeah, I, I will. I'm, I'm actually the uh, geomechanics advisor in the mechanical engineering department. So the geomechanics program is joint between mechanical engineering 
in Earth and Environmental Sciences. So typically students will have to take half of their technical courses uh, in mechanical engineering and half of the courses of their courses, technical courses from Earth and Environmental Sciences, what we call geology. Uh, there's an advisor for students in the in the uh, Earth and Environmental Sciences uh, 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 department. I'm the advisor for the mechanical engineering department. Uh, so the degree is a joint degree between two between two uh, uh, departments. Mechanical engineering is part of the School of Engineering. Earth and Environmental Sciences is part of Arts and Sciences, and we combine. Actually, uh, actually, uh, uh, Kaylin and I are recently involved in revamping uh, the requirements for this degree. So, so we're working together with our colleagues in Earth and Environmental Sciences to update uh, the requirements for this degree. Yeah. To, to make it clear, not to make it harder. <laughs> yeah, to, to, to make it clear and, and more modern, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a little bit easier, I would argue, but that's a different, we, we can talk about this. Yeah. Um, and the last slide to share um, is the research that we offer and a lot of the um, topics that are currently being offered as well. Um, a lot of variety. So um, as long as you are being open, openly communicating, um, stopping by and seeing people and talking about what they're doing, I think you'll find a lot of things to uh, enjoy and participate in. Um, I'm also going to highlight um, Jacob and Aaron and their participation in ASME and SWE. If you want to talk about um, some of your student experience there, I'm pulling you in now. It's your turn. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. But, so I'm the president of ASME, and Erin's also part of ASME, and she's part of SWE. Um, it's a great club to be in when you're, as a mechanical engineer at the U of R, because um, it's great to just meet other um, kids who like are like sophomores, juniors, and seniors, so you can talk to them about other classes, and just to um, work a lot with your department. And it's great for a resume, because ASME is um, world renowned. So they definitely know who you are when you're on the bomb, um, when it's like right on the resume. And it's something you can have in common with when you wanna talk with somebody, some other mechanical engineer that you're interning for. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, so like Jacob said, I'm part of the um, executive board for ASME and for the Society of Women Engineers. Um, so in SWE, we do a lot of the same things that other professional organizations do. So we have a bunch of like workshops to build up your like leadership skills, but we also do a lot of social events, um, some that are within the club. So uh, we get together and do fun things. We just had a baking night um, last Sunday where we got together and made cookies. Um, so we do cute little things like that. We also have a really big social event, for, um, the engineering ball, which we just started last year and it became like a huge success. Um, so our hope is to continue that every single year. And that's mm -hmm. for all of the engineers. Um, Jacob was there. Yeah. Um, super, super fun. So basically, SWE's like mission is to make a community among um, women in engineering because we are in the minority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are two great clubs to join. Two more we really suggest is what Professor Lambro was saying mm -hmm. earlier, uh, Baja and Solar Splash. You get like true hands-on experience, especially as a first year. Uh, when you're taking all of like your basic classes, like your math and your physics and your beginning Mechie classes, you don't really have like that much hands-on experience. So if you join Baja or Solar Splash, it kind of like forces you right away um, just to learn. And that, like that's something that we're really appreciative about um, over here. And then one class that I, for either parents to tell their kids here, the, the kids are on now, EAS 141. It allows you to work in the machine shop and it gets you to learn all of the um, basically like the machines um, and how to use tools. And then you're allowed to be in the shop and use it for the remainder four years that you're here. So you're not, I don't think you're allowed to take it uh, in the fall semester, but in the spring semester, I heavily suggest it. I took it in the spring semester of my first year and I've been able to be in that shop since. So it's a great way. It's a two credit class. So it's not hard in any way. You get to create your own project at the end. Um, yeah, it's uh, honestly something really fun to get hands on right away. Hi, uh, Katie, uh, can you say a few words about uh, being involved in as a teaching assistant? I know you've done, uh, uh, you've been uh, a teaching assistant for several courses and I've heard uh, great comments about you. So can you tell me a little bit what it's like uh, being involved with teaching? How does how can an undergraduate be involved in teaching as opposed to learning? Yeah. Well, it's great to hear that such great reviews are coming my way. Well, I appreciate that. Um, but I would highly recommend TA. Um, Aaron's my TA currently for the course that Professor Lambropoulos teaches heat transfer, and she's great. 
um, it really connects you not only with your peers who are in classes, you know, higher than you and they can help you and guide you. Um, I know multiple times last year, um, freshmen would even just come to me asking for advice on classes they should take. So it didn't even just have to be about the course itself. Um, just advice from someone who's going on the same track and is further down the line than you. Um, but it also is a really great way to connect with the professors here. I think I've built a really strong relationship with the mechanical engineering department solely from my TA. Um, I think I have a very strong relationship with majority of the professors there and it's gotten me research opportunities. It's gotten me other job opportunities like um, the UR Mechanical Engineering Instagram account. Go follow it if you're not. Um, but it's really nice to have that connection with the professors too because as you start to need more things as you move on or need advice, um, there's professors you learn who are more fit for the specific advice or task you need and they're more willing to help you not that they're more willing not willing to help people who don't know them but they know you as a person and they're more willing to you know allocate their time to someone who's taking time to get to know them um and their offices are usually always open that's something i really love about here is that you know if i have a question the other day i was asking professor Rambropoulos, his door was open asking him for advice on what to do after school here uh, whether to move on to grad school or going to industry and we had a great conversation just walking by um, and all of that was built from TA and you know getting close with the professor you're TA with so I TA with the head of the department professor Perucchio um, and they start to introduce you to the other professors in the department so then I got to know professor Shang a little bit better and now I do research with her and then they introduce you with the advisors like uh, Kay Lynn and Cody um, and all them in that office there um, and it's just really nice to create a bond, not only with your peers, because you become friends with your TAs. As you move on, you may become a TA with them or seeing them in the halls, you know, or seeing them at events. The Mechie department does a lot of events. Um, so you have more friends just outside of your year, um, but also building that relationship with the professors. So I would highly recommend TA if you have the opportunity to. Thank you. I, so I had, I had a couple of uh, questions for Aaron and Jacob. So the question to Aaron would be, how does a student combine a strong interest in music with an engineering education? And the question for Jacob would be, how does one go about thinking about studying abroad? So Aaron, what 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 did you start first? Yeah, so currently, in addition to majoring in mechanical engineering, um, I'm doing a double minor in music and musical acoustics. So for music, um, you get to get credit for playing in ensembles and you also have the opportunity to take lessons at Eastman, which I did for a majority of my time he here. Um, super fun. It's a really great opportunity to learn from the students there and for um, for musical acoustics. So that's part of the audio music engineering program. Um, so I get a lot of questions like, oh, why didn't you just major in AME? Um, and the answer is that a lot of it was focused on like audio recording production. That's not really what I wanted to do. And um, Meki, I wanted more of like the basis of like more science, more design, stuff like that. So with the, there, um, there are a bunch of concentrations for the AME minors that you can choose. Um, so I'm doing the acoustics one and I'm actually going to be going to grad school for acoustics, which is very exciting. Um, so I'm kind of combining all like the science and engineering stuff I learned in Meki with my passion for music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then for me, for my question, I knew before college, so like when I was in um, your guys' shoes right now, I wanted to go abroad. Like ever since I graduated high school, it's like, that's the one thing like I really want to do. I know U of R has a great program and I've um, spoken to a couple of people before that they're going abroad and I wanted to make it happen, but I was a little nervous with the Mechie degree because the, the Mechie degree is very like rigid and um, they're like, you like you're assigned each class per semester basically but um you have already did a great job honest professor lambro is the guy you work with when it comes to like coordinating with classes and i last year so my junior uh spring i went to madrid spain and um it was one of the best experiences i think i've ever had um uh, and then but before that just coordinating with the classes and um classes in u of r to match the classes in madrid it's very easy, um, well worth it. It's um, nothing to stress about. And then going abroad in general was just the greatest experience. I got to be in a light of new culture, new people, new foods, 
uh, try everything. So that's something I really encourage. Um, if you like, if you if you want to go abroad, it's not just Spain, but uh, that we have people going to Australia, New Zealand, Korea, uh, England. Um, there's honestly, you can go, you pretty much can go anywhere um, that you want to. But yeah, something definitely I recommend. Do we have any other questions? I can ask some more questions to our undergraduate students, uh, 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 Caroline, but uh, are there any questions from the audience that we make sure that we address them? I think we got them all. Uh, so, so I'll make uh, one last round of questions to uh, to Aaron, uh, Jacob, and Katie. So if there was one piece of advice beyond what we've all said in the last uh, 50 minutes, one piece of advice that you would give to incoming first year undergraduates, one piece of advice, what would it be beyond what we spoke about in this class? I guess I'll start. I would say the first thing that came to my head is introduce yourself to your professors, um, especially with the Mechie department. Um, they're great people. They're amazing to work with. And if you have a if you have like a name to a face right away, you can always like go to office hours and count on them, and they know who you are, and you form a relationship. Um, that's I think like the best part of the experience, um, the learning experience. Erin. Um. Yeah. So for me, kind of like going off of what Katie was talking about being a TA. My best advice would be to like start meeting your TAs immediately. Um, that's just, you know, anywhere you go to school. So like for Katie's class, I've TA'd them four times now. Um, so I have great relationships with all of the students. And um, it's just, it's really nice for me. And I hope it's nice for them too, to always have a familiar face to talk to um, someone, you know, that you can count on. Terrific. Uh, Katie, uh, what, what, single piece of advice would you provide for an incoming first year student? Yeah, I would say don't have a complete rigid view of what you're going to be doing. I feel like when I came into school, um, I figured I was just going to be taking my classes, hopefully get an internship and leave. And I was like, I'm never going to do research or anything. I hate writing. I hate reading. I hate doing all that. Um, but when you open up your eyes more to things, you're not so you know, wanting to do and things that are more uncomfortable, you may be pleasantly surprised. Um, I had the opportunity to work in some research with Professor Shang uh, this semester, and I actually really like what I'm doing, uh, something that I completely thought I would never like. Um, I'm doing internships in fields that I never thought I would like, construction. I always thought I would be NASA or nothing, uh, you know, and I really enjoyed my experience. So I would say, don't set yourself up starting here being like, I'm going to get my degree and I'm going to only work at NASA or I'm only going to work at SpaceX. Open your eyes up to smaller companies. Open your eyes up to opportunities that don't, aren't as appealing and you may change your mind and have a completely different outlook for the best. Uh, so, so, so there's a question in the in the chat, uh, in the in the Q&A session. Uh, there was one which I answered. Uh, I typed in, it was an easy answer, how you combine computer science and mechanical engineering. But another question was, uh, how does it work to potentially stay one more year to get a, a master's degree? Uh, U of R has uh, uh, what we call a, uh, uh, it, it, you can essentially do undergraduate plus master's degree in exactly five years, literally finish within five years. Our students who stay on for their master's for their fifth year uh, uh, actually get a, a larger tuition, a larger tuition uh, discount. Uh, and and uh, uh, they have to be involved as being graduate TAs for some of the undergraduate courses, the sort of uh, uh, experience that Aaron uh, uh, and Katie uh, were actually uh, talking about. So it's very doable, uh, very highly recommended. Uh, I think in the long term, having a master's degree over the period of three or four years, financially, uh, it pays off. Uh, it pays off hugely. Uh, both of my two uh, uh, sons who went through U of R. Uh, did go on to get a master's degree, one immediately after finishing U of R, the other one worked for three years and then went to get on a master's. So there are different modes of actually doing that, but certainly you can get a master's in in in, in five in, in five years. Uh, we have a few minutes. So let me let me turn to uh Kaylin. Kaylin, what would be the the single uh uh most important advice you would give to an incoming uh, student other than all the hints <laughs> and, and information we provided uh, so far? Yeah, well, first I wanted to tack on 
um, for someone to tack on that, uh, four students who are interested in pursuing a minor, a master's degree, um, if you follow our standard curriculum, you will also have the space to take some upper level graduate courses. And as long as you don't use that towards your graduation requirements, like your 128 credits needed to graduate or um, the core courses that you have to complete, um, you can transfer those courses towards your master's or PhD degree as well. Um, so that can give you a leg up as well. Um, piece of advice um, that I wish students knew more of and or that I wish I had known is to um, make use of all of your connections. Go to your office hours, talk with the instructor. Um, I, I think a lot of students have to um, analyze how they view office hours. Like when you're in high school, you kind of view office hours as a punishment. Like, like you know, I don't really need it because I'm doing well in the course. Um, meanwhile, in college, that is like the tool of success if you want to be in the upper 10% of the course is to go to office hours, utilize those, talk to, you, to the instructors. Um, so it's a tough transition to make if you don't realize that you're viewing it as um, like a punishment. Like, I don't need it because I'm doing okay or, you know, I'm, I'm a good kid. I'm not struggling. I don't need office hours. It's like a, it's a different viewpoint that you have to take. Um, the other piece of information, um, get... Like talk to people early. Don't wait until you're like, ooh, I don't know if I can turn this around on my own anymore. Because sometimes then you're working in like um, summer courses or retaking a course because um, you waited till you know beyond half the half point of the semester. Um, and there are no stupid questions. There's always a whole group of people in the class who are hoping someone's going to ask the same question, but we're all too shy to ask it in class. Um, so if you can find the courage to be the person you're going to find another 20 people who are like, oh my God, thank God you asked the question. <laughs> I'm thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely um, don't be afraid to ask questions. Talk to all of your resources. Um, visit me at least once a semester and you'll be um, good to graduate on time with smooth sailing. Uh, Caroline, any, any uh, uh, advice uh, from the admissions office? I mean, admissions, you have admitted uh, uh, the students, so your job is almost done. You're almost uh, uh, looking at uh, next year's uh, applicants. But from your from the admissions, is there some kind of overriding advice, uh, single piece of advice that you can give to incoming first year students? And then I will ask the same question to Andre as well. So Andre, be be ready. Yes. Hi, everyone. I would again congratulate you all for being admitted to the University of Rochester, and. My advice for you right now is to continue to connect with the university and do you know pursue these events, these virtual events or on-campus events that we have to help you make that final decision to decide where you are you want to go to college. These are valuable sessions that we have. You can interact with professors, students, faculty, and so continuing to connect with us right up until that may deadline when you have to decide about college is uh something i'd advise students to do thanks thanks thank you carol uh andrea any uh uh single piece of advice from your from your desk to uh incoming first year of uh first year students uh my only piece of advice is to be yourself take your time um, if you're looking at the University of Rochester, it also means that you're looking at some other great institutions. Uh, you will not make a bad decision. Um, right now, you're just trying to figure out the right place for you. And that is why we're doing sessions like this, um, so that you can make the most informed decision that you can. Uh, I know it's a stressful situation, but if you're looking at Rochester, that means you're looking at uh, other great schools, you will not make a bad decision. So take your time, um, take in all the information that you need and be confident in the decision that you make. Obviously, we all hope that that decision is the University of Rochester because we all think that this is a great place to study, um, but it isn't the perfect place for everyone uh, and that is okay. Uh, but you have some great options and, and take it full advantage of those and um, you will not make a bad decision. Uh, there, was, uh, there was one question on how collaborative students are at the university. Uh, so for that, uh, I would like to turn uh, to uh, Jacob and Aaron. Uh, 
the two of you are graduating in in in, in exactly in five weeks in four or five weeks. So how collaborative mm -hmm. have you found your educational experience at the university? Mm -hmm. How collaborative? Mm -hmm. Or, or do you think students are more collaborative or competitive? Uh, well, collaborative versus competitive. How did you how do you find the balance between collaboration and competition in your own experience? And then maybe Katie can can answer uh, this question from a third year student perspective. Well, yeah, that's a great question for our class. So our class was the COVID class. So freshman sophomore year, we really didn't know each other because we were just just like this, just like virtual just no one sharing their screen is basically, uh, or like um, sharing them, yeah. And so I would say first so like first and second year, just for our scenario, I guess it'd be considered competitive just because we didn't really know each other, like um, the fellow Mechies. But then as like junior and senior year came along, we got to really know each other, we're all in classes together. We literally go from class to class together. Um, we've honestly become like a really good, like like friend group, I would say like, the Mechies is one of the closest out of all of the majors at U of R. I, I would be confident to say that just because at least for our class, mm -hmm. we really got to like just connect with each other. And when we go to recitations and office hours together, we basically just like form our own group. So it became very collaborative, um, always working together. Anytime there's like a homework assignment, there, a lot of times we're sitting all together doing it. Um, but yeah. Yeah, like we always offer our help to one another. There's never a time when someone asks you for help and mm -hmm. you say no. That just doesn't no. happen. We, we always are helping each other out. Yeah. Uh, Katie, uh, concluding uh, remarks on uh, uh, collaboration versus competition among the students before we, uh, we're on top of the hour right now. So, so before we conclude our meeting. Yeah, um, I think I definitely agree with them. I think when you first walk in freshman year, you're still in that kind of high school mentality. So you're kind of very competitive with everyone. Uh, then you take your first exam and you're humbled and realize you're all in this together. Um, and it makes you grow a lot closer. And from that point moving forward, you are just like a giant group. I completely agree with Aaron and Jacob on the Mechies being the closest of all. I, I think Aaron can agree with me. I mean, she's my workshop leader. Definitely not a professional setting in there. It's definitely just a bunch of kids goofing around um, and getting their work done. Uh, we're just like a big family. It's There's no competition at all once you get up to this point. Great. Uh, Caroline, I, th I think this concludes our presentation, I think, so that- Well, yes, thank you everybody. Really, this has been a wonderful conversation and I wanna thank Professor Lombropoulos and Kaylin Katie, Jacob, Aaron, everybody who was part of this session, my colleague Dre as well. And we really appreciate all this information. I'm sure these students really enjoyed hearing from you. And would it be all right if students had further questions? Could they reach out to your department and ask? Absolutely, absolutely. All our all our contact information is on is on the department uh, website. So so uh, Kaylin, just uh, uh, put in the in the chat box. Uh, her contact information, her contact email. So feel free to ask her a question. If Kaylin cannot answer the question, she will ask one of the faculty uh, to address the question. Uh, but between her and, and, and us, we should be able to answer pretty much any question. Uh, we're quite experienced in advising and in teaching. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Again, thank you to everybody involved today. And we wish you all students, Rochester admitted students, the best of luck. And we're here to help in any way that we can, okay? Congratulations, everybody. Take care now. Thank Take you. Care. Thank care. you, everyone.